it! Just do it! Don't let your dreams be dreams. Yesterday, you said tomorrow. So just do it! Make your dreams come true! Just do it! Welcome to Successful Dropout. This podcast is for the outliers, the innovators, the rebels, those that dare to dream and act on their dreams. I'm your host, Kylan Ginger. Join me as we find out what it takes to drop out, grind, and succeed. This episode is brought to you by Praxis. Guys, if you've been listening for a while and you're inspired to drop out, grind, and succeed and to start turning your dreams into reality, Praxis helps you go from student to startup in just nine months, okay? To land your dream job or to start your own company, you don't need to sit in more classrooms or blast out resumes or go through years of training. You can start today. Praxis combines a three-month professional boot camp with a six-month paid apprenticeship at a startup that leads directly to a full-time job. And startups aren't just for coders, by the way. They're sales positions, marketing, operations. Even if you're not sure what you're interested in, Praxis places you with a growing, dynamic company where you get paid to do work you love to do, where you get to become part of a team, and where you learn how to create value. It's not just an internship, it's real work. In addition to the apprenticeship, you complete an intensive education program that combines professional development training, skill building projects, and one-on-one coaching. You'll leave the program with a full-time job offer and the skills and experiences you'll need to work for any company that you want to work for or to even start your own company. No degree is required to get started on your career, guys. Whether you're an ambitious go-getter right out of high school, a creative thinker who's bored in college, or a college grad looking forward to something better than more school or a cubicle job, Praxis is a phenomenal resource for you. $50,000, okay? $50,000 is the average salary that Praxis graduates are getting with these full-time jobs that they get right after the program in in less than a year. If you want to learn more, go to discoverpraxis.com, discoverpraxis.com, and let them know that you found out about them through Successful Dropout and start turning your dreams into reality, guys. And with that being said, let's get to the show. What is up, Successful Dropouts? Get stoked because today on the show we have Shane Milach. Shane's entrepreneurial journey started back in 2006 when he dropped out of university. He went from offline business in the hardware market to e-commerce to affiliate niche sites and from hungry and desperate to well-fed and successful. Now, he creates and sells software and information products for a living. He sold thousands of copies of his products and he's built up a business from absolute scratch to seven figures and beyond. So Shane, that's the intro I have for you, man. But tell us a little bit more about yourself and what you do. Yeah, thanks. First of all, thanks for having me on, Kylan. I'm glad to be here. And uh, yeah, so what I do is my current main gig is uh, Thrive Themes. And Thrive Themes is a software company. We, we create WordPress plugins and themes. And what sets our products apart is that we build everything around conversion optimization, whereas most things that if you look for a WordPress theme, they're usually built around design, right? They have a certain look, right? Whereas we don't care as much about design or basically for us, design is only useful in so far as it serves conversions. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the main thing that I've been working on for the past couple of years. So Thrive Themes and how did that idea, how did that business come about? Um, Tell us the story, how that, how you came up with that idea. Yeah, I think like, like most cases, um, it, it arose from basically being immersed in, uh, you know, immersed in a target market, let's say, right? Because if you, if you look at our, at our target market, at the person, the kind of person who our products are for, I was that kind of person that still am because it's the kind of person who has a need of, who builds their own websites and who has a need for a conversion optimized website. And so this is something that, you know, because, you know, as you said in your intro, I did, I did quite a lot of different things, and I built many, many websites. I basically built websites on a regular basis, whether that was, you know, affiliate websites when I was doing that SEO stuff, 
and then later building websites for my various products that I created and sold. And, and every time I was basically faced with the same problem, it's how do I kind of wrestle WordPress under control to the point where I can create even just a simple sales page that is geared towards conversions and isn't, you know, isn't, isn't too slow, isn't too cumbersome, isn't cluttered with all kinds of stuff that's not supposed to be there. Um, and I always found that surprisingly difficult. And, um, and so there was this, I found myself in a position of this need and I started looking around and I started figuring out, well, I'm not the only one who has this problem. I'm not the only one who complains about, you know, not being able to find, uh, there's certainly plenty of WordPress themes that are, that look fancy and whatnot, but I want, you know, I have a business, I'm trying to make money here. I don't care that much about whether, you know, whether my site uses the latest, whatever, uh, web design trends, right. tricks, whatever. I, I just want to make some sales. And all this, usually the fancy web design stuff really just gets in the way of that, right? And so I have to kind of, I buy the theme and I strip out half of it before I can start using it. <laughs> and uh, and so, and I found, yeah, that, that we're actually in good company. I wasn't the only person with this problem. And from there, um, basically, I partnered up with, with Paul McCarthy, who's my co-founder for Thrive Themes. And we started by creating a fairly simple plug-in to kind of test the waters to see, you know, do people have this need? Can we sell a product here? It was very, very successful, and we basically just kept building from there. Hmm. Yeah, what a great example, man, of of uh, using your personal experience to find a gap in the in the marketplace, a need that hasn't been met yet. And so, is that going pretty well for you then, Thrive Themes? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, it's it's growing very fast. It's been around for a bit more than two years, and we have more than thirty thousand customers now. We we have wow. uh, thousands of active members. Um, and is that on a is it a one time buy basis or, or basis? Sorry, or or a reoccurring uh, model? We have both. Yeah, we have both. So you can buy uh, individual products from us at a one one time price, or you can become a member to just get everything. So Shane, you're calling. You mentioned from. Romania. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm interested. What you know? Where Where are you from? And and how are you in Romania? And you mentioned you're you're living there now. But what's kind of your personal story there? You seem like you're you're kind of moving to different countries a lot. And and uh, I imagine what you do it allows you to be pretty uh, mobile. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. So I've been basically been living in many different countries. I I don't even know how many actually. But you know, I've lived in many countries in, in the last four years. Um, and, and yeah, that's one of the advantages of, of the work I do is that it's totally location independent. Uh, all I need is an internet connection to work, which is nice. And yeah, right now I'm in Romania because here we're working together with a company, uh, where basically we have the majority of our development team is here and our support team as well. So, um, and so I'm, I'm here for a while to kind of work a bit more closely with the team, but yeah. Basically, on at different times of the year, I'm in different places. Uh, when you move, is it more about like you just said the the strategic, um, uh, you know, opportunity for your business, or is it sometimes just because you feel like living in a certain place? Yeah, it's both. Yeah, I mean, uh, I would say you know half the time I move somewhere for some uh, because of for some strategic reason, let's say, and and half the time I just move somewhere because I feel like it. Huh. So cool, man. Now uh, we'll come back to your your more of your entrepreneurial journey in a bit, but right now I want to go back to uh, the beginning. To you know, this is successful dropout. I want to hear about your dropout experience, man, and and uh, how that came about. So take us back to the beginning and and tell us that story. Sure. Yeah. So for me, I guess you could say that it didn't really come as a big surprise that I dropped out of out of university because I was never the academic type. Uh, I was always, in fact, I was I was always the the student who was always on the brink of failing. You know, I was always on the brink of having to repeat a year. I was always like problematic. Um, so I, I basically always struggled in school. And uh, the only reason I really made it to university was to prove one of my teachers wrong, who said I could never make it. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, basically once once I arrived there, it did become very clear to me that this this wasn't going to happen i mean you know i i just i'd really i, I think I, i'd really kind of used 
almost by uh, I, I'd like used up all my willpower to get to that point, like I said, to prove this guy wrong. And I'd really just run out of the capacity to spend time learning things I wasn't actually interested in. And another thing that was um, a big issue for me is that I really have a strong drive to create things. And, and I always had that even bef you know, before I was an entrepreneur. I, I had this, this urge to create something. I just had no idea what to do with it, basically. Um, and so the prospect of spending another five years you know, just studying things and not doing anything was... It was just not just not, not going to yeah. happen. And so yeah. um, it was kind of, you know, I, I basically spent one year at university kind of slowly. I kind of dropped out in slow motion during 12 or 13 months, you know. Um, and the, the biggest problem was that I didn't know I didn't know what else to do, basically. I just knew that this was definitely not it. And were you, you know, you mentioned you were having kind of a tougher time in school. It always seemed like you might have to retake some stuff. And I think you were more talking about high school there. But um, I'm curious, why was that? Were you just, was it just because you were flat out not interested at all? Or did you have some other projects you were working on? Were you building anything um, during this time as well? No, no. So at the time, uh, since my early teens, my life's purpose was basically martial arts. I was training martial arts. Oh. You know, that, was, that was the only thing I was really interested in. Or actually, it's not true. I was interested in a lot of stuff, but that was my, my life's passion was martial arts. And I was interested in a lot of other stuff. But I really think, you know, it's just some people thrive in, in an academic um, environment and some don't. I think it's, it comes down to personality types. It probably also comes down to whatever, you know, how you in your upbringing, whatever, right? But for some reason, it's it's clearly something for some people that kind of clicks. It makes sense, uh, you know, and I wasn't one of those people and because for some people, it's just this eternal struggle, right? Um, and I really think it's, and it's also one of the, one of the problems because um, I, of course, I felt very, very incompetent because of this, right? It's like the main thing that you're supposed to do is you're right. supposed to go to school and you're supposed to be good at that. And I was not yeah. good at that. And I felt... This was definitely also something that caused self-esteem issues for me. And, you know, I felt uh, like an incompetent person. What I have discovered in the meantime is that I happen to excel at other things that um, that maybe your typical you know person who does very well in academia would struggle with a lot. I happen to be good at other stuff, and it's you know what I found out is that it's fine. <laughs> it's fine to be good at the stuff that I'm good at, even though you never get good grades for this stuff. Right. Now I'm trying to. I, I want to pick out here. What do you think it is about you? Because you're you're obviously um, you've obviously been very successful. And even though you didn't, you know, excel or really fit well um, into school, um, you were still able to to drop out and and be driven enough to create what you've created now. And I'm trying to draw. You know, what it is about you personally that allows you to do that versus say, because um, there's a lot of. I think there's a lot of kids a lot of a lot of teens a lot of young adults that they're in school and they're thinking man this is not for me it, it, this sucks and everything mm -hmm. but they're also not driven right they're lazy yep. they, they don't have um they don't aspire to much and so they end up dropping out and working a minimum wage job for you know and so you know it's like those kind of people are the kind of people that i would encourage to stay in school and to to, to not quit mm -hmm. that but then there are people like you who obviously you kind of dropped out for the same reasons. It just didn't click with you. But yet, you know, what do you think it is about you personally that still made you successful, that gave you that drive? Well, I can tell you that one of the things that or one of the early things that I kind of figured out that I could make work for myself is that I just have a very, um, let's say, an all or nothing kind of attitude towards things. So I tend to be all in or all out. And this is a problem with with school where because and you know also when I I was bad at school but I was bad at school on average the thing is I was I was pretty good at some topics and then really awful at others and so it was it was these extremes that were the problem um, I'm I'm not very good at being average at ten different things I'm absolutely terrible at eight things and I'm <laughs> above average good at two things right. 
And so one of the things I figured out is that I have this, I have a certain obsessive nature where uh, when I get into something, I get into something really, really deep. And martial arts was one of those examples, right? I, I uh, wasn't just, it wasn't just a hobby for me. It was my life. And for, you know, for 10 years, I, that was what I did all day. I was training seven days a week for, for a long time period like for probably five out of those 10 uh, 10 years i was wow i was training six to seven days a week um i was martial arts was what i talked about what i thought about what i wrote about my friends were people from the martial arts world with whom i trained that was you know it's that level of obsession right and but and i have that for other things as well i'm interested in many things and and it will happen to me periodically that i get you know that something hooks me and I get really, really into it where just my entire life revolves around a single topic for a few months at least at a time. And, uh, and this is, again, yeah, like I said, this is not good for, for academia where you're supposed to, you know, basically people tell you what you, need to be, what you need to be at least average at, a range of topics you need to be at least average at. Uh, and you have to be doing all that stuff. Uh, so it's not suitable for that. And I, but I think that's one of the things, you know, if... If someone's kind of on the edge and they think, oh, school isn't for me, well, the question is, you know, can you do that? Do you have a track record of, and, and I would also encourage, not just ask yourself, you know, do I think I can do this? Do you have a track record of doing this? Do you have a track record of doing, you know, an, an outstanding amount of work and putting an outstanding amount of effort mm. into something, even if you didn't get any extrinsic reward for it? Because that's definitely something I had going for me, even though at the time, you know, it took me a while to discover that. But uh, at the time, I didn't realize that. But this is this is something that I that I had and that I very deliberately at one point realized, oh, this is a thing I do, right? I get obsessed with something. I get really deep into something. And this is how I can acquire new skills fairly quickly. And so at some point, I decided, well, what if I'd, I'd been putting my energy into a lot of passion projects that were... Uh, that were rewarding, but financially unrewarding, right? That I wasn't getting paid for. I was, I was like, you know, as an example, I did, I did stuff with kids. For example, I, I teach kids martial arts. Or at one point, I, uh, I also taught like rock climbing to to kids, and I, I got really into that. And so I was, you know, and that took many hours of my time. And I got into that, and I did, um, I did a bunch of other stuff like that, you know, where I'd really pursue something. Uh, put a lot of work into something, but nobody paid me for it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> at some point, I decided, well, what if I try to apply this same pattern that I've successfully used before to get very good at something in a very short period of time? What if I apply that to something that actually gets me paid? And and that's how I got into the whole online business thing. So that's interesting. I'm noticing kind of a theme here of self-awareness, right? You've got to be able to be mm. self-aware and have the the wisdom and kind of wherewithal to understand you know, what's your like. And so it sounds like Shane, you understood, you know, early on, like you get obsessive over, over something and you thought, well, Hey, you know, obviously this is why school's not working out. I need to focus all my, my obsessiveness and energy, um, and decision-making power on something that, that can be financially lucrative that I also love enough to get, you know, stick with it in the long term and, really make successful. So successful dropouts, I think that's a real key thing to, to remember here is you really need to take uh, an account of yourself, your personality. Um, if you're the kind of person that can succeed outside of, of the traditional pipeline. So yeah, and I would add to that what's very, very important. If you try to assess yourself like this, how you feel about yourself or what you believe about yourself, you have to leave those completely by the side and in fact so another thing that I can tell you right away is a very important tool in my life has just been writing writing as a tool of self-discovery and so on and and so one of the things you could do is you could write down everything you believe about yourself everything you believe to be true about yourself um, and kind of put that in one column and then write down what you have an actual track record of doing and then you completely ignore everything in the what you believe in about yourself column because it doesn't matter and you look at only what is in the column about what you have a track record of actually doing. Because it doesn't matter if you think of yourself as someone who can work hard 
or uh, someone who can, you know, see a goal through to the end or whatever. If you don't have a track record of actually doing that, it doesn't matter what you believe, right? Um, and I think that's very, very important, especially when it comes to making a decision like this. If you, uh, yeah, if, if you make a decision like this based on what you believe, what kind of a person you believe you are, rather than what kind of a person you have proven yourself to be in the recent past, then you yeah. are setting yourself up for failure. And so again, Shane, for you, that was looking back at your history with martial arts and, uh, mar sorry, martial arts and just realizing how dedicated you were and how far you'd come and how kind of obsessed about that you were. And that was kind of your, um, the validation you needed. Yeah. And more specifically than that, like, uh, like you said in the beginning, I was in the hardware market. Uh, I was selling basically computer parts, um, for a while and, in that, there's a niche in computer parts, which is, which is water cooling computers. And that is something that I got into. That's one of those things that I just got obsessed with for a relatively short period of time. But that was, that was kind of my, that was the real validation of that. Because the martial arts thing was something that I did over a very long period of time. The water cooling thing, there I experienced that with, and I have to say with absolutely extreme uh, dedication, I was... I actually don't even know, but I mean, I was working 12 to 16 hour days there for just forever, <laughs> basically. Wow. Um, but by doing that and by being totally obsessed with that, I became an expert in that field. And, you know, like a re obviously the niche is a small niche, but I became right. a recognizable expert in that niche within basically within a year. And that was for me kind of an aha moment where I was like, oh, wow. That was, you know, that actually was fast, right? Uh, because the martial arts thing, yeah, that was over over ten years. But but the, this water cooling thing was like, oh wow, look at look at how far I've come in one year. And again, it was one of those things I didn't really get paid for that. So I thought, what if I did this in an area where I can actually get paid, right? What if I could make a leap like this in one year somewhere uh, where I have a chance of making some money from it? Oh, okay. So this water cooling thing, this was happening while you were in school? No, this was, no, this was already after him. Okay. Okay. I see. And, and again, this is water cooling for, for com computers, like the yep. interior of the, yeah, I don't understand it that much, but yeah, I mean, it's basically, uh, you know, it's, it's basically just something that people do who like computer hardware and have too much money in their hands <laughs> and so you know it's totally like it's totally unnecessary it's just a cool thing to do if you're into hardware i see but that was also part of the validation that you needed to to be like okay yeah i'm the kind of person that can that can pull this off yeah i mean that's that's where i because you know at the time i was already kind of self-employed i was doing this e-commerce thing but i hadn't found anything that really worked for me and and you know like i said for me like the the dropout was it wasn't like the one moment where I made a decision and then changed everything. It w was like this inevitable decline and then I had to find something else to do. So, you know, certainly my story isn't like an example of how it should be done. It was, uh, I kind of just desperately tried to find something to do and it took me quite a while to find my footing. So transitioning a bit more now to, um, I'd love you to tell us a little bit more about how your friends and family reacted to you dropping out. It was basically mostly quiet disappointment, I think. <laughs> like it wasn't a big deal, but nobody was happy about it. Right, right. And so did you communicate with your parents leading up to that? Did they kind of always know like he's never going to finish college or? I'm, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm not, I wasn't very communicative about it. I didn't really know how to, you know, how to bring it up or anything, but. W would you have done anything differently? Well, with hindsight? Yeah. I mean, who knows? I would have done many things different. I wouldn't have gone to university to begin with. Yeah, <laughs> but that's what I've done differently. Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering because one of the questions I love to ask is for anybody out there because getting your parents' approval for something like this or at least communicating with them and having them understand even if, if they don't support you know, why you're dropping out is very important to a lot of people that listen to the show. And so I just wonder, you know, based off of your experience, what advice you would have for anybody listening who's, who's dropping out or on the verge, um, but they're not getting the support from their parents or anything. Do you have any advice for them? Look, 
it comes down to the track record thing again. If you can make, you know, if you can point to past events in your life and say, look, here's the evidence from my actual life, not my aspirations, but my actual life. Here's the evidence that I can do this. If you can build a strong enough case, then that's also what you should use to, to argue, you know, with anyone who might be opposed to this. But, you know, for most people, I also have to say, you know, my, my perspective is that for most people, it's not a good idea to drop out of college to, to become an entrepreneur. It's just like it's not, idea, not a good idea to quit your job to become an entrepreneur, right? Uh, because I think if it's that kind of thinking, it's like, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit this and then start the other thing. Well, the problem is you have to realize that uh, there's going to be a lot of failure that you have to go through before you make this work in most cases. And if you can't make this work as a part-time gig, then you probably can't make it work as a full-time gig either. Uh, and so, you know, that's because that's another thing that, that I was also doing, you know, um, I, di- I never really took a risk here because I was, after, after university, I was working some shitty part-time jobs and I was keeping myself afloat with that while I was working on my own stuff. And so I never kind of took a leap where I was, okay, I'm going to, you know, quit my job and I have, uh, you know, I can, <laughs> I can stay, uh, I can survive for three months with my money. So I have to kind of make this work within the next three months. I've never did anything like that. I was supporting myself with, with shitty part-time jobs um, while I was building up uh, some income from other sources. And then once I had enough income from other sources, I worked less. And then once I had a lot of income from other sources, I stopped working. And, uh, and so I would say the same thing for, you know, if you're, if you're uh, basically w- whatever you want to start, start it now, start it, you know, do, do two to four hours a day on it in the evenings, in the mornings, find a way to make it work before you jump. That's a great point. So making a smoother transition instead of just a hard, okay, I'm done. And now I'm going to start working on my idea or my business. If you can, yeah. successful dropout, start it now while you're in college. You, you do have access to a lot of resources in college as well, and you can kind of gather, get a bit of proof of concept and maybe a minimum viable product out there. And yeah. then I think what Shane's saying is, is once you've got even something like that, that is huge with your parents to be able to show them actual evidence and here's proof that what I'm doing can has a good chance of being successful. So great, great point, man. Um, I'm curious, what was... A big. What was your biggest fear dropping out, and how did you manage it, or, or were you afraid at all? Um, I don't know if it was fear. I think at the time it was just. I mean, I just didn't know, you know, what was what was going to happen, and I did have, uh, I did have self doubt and all that. Um, but again, it was because it wasn't like a dramatic decision. It wasn't like this leap that I took. It was just like, well, this isn't going to work. And so I'm going to do some more work on my part-time job and I'm going to somehow have to figure out uh, what else to do. I think, I mean, one of, the, one of the things that also happens in parallel here is that I, I did a lot of work just on myself because um, I, I certainly had a lot of like just personal issues, right? S- self-esteem issues, insecurity, uh, just negativity and things like that that I had to deal with. Yeah, who, do- who doesn't? Yeah, and, um, and I think... At least for me, this was also very important to deal with because, um, you know, as I, I would certainly not be very effective as an entrepreneur if I still had all that baggage. So, right. so one of the things that happened also during that time is just kind of trying to unpack and deal with all of that. And, and one of the things that I think helped me was a certain, just a certain um, confidence coming from the fact that that I knew that I would just be able to stick with this, um, you know, that I, I knew I'd be able to just grind it out, basically. So even though I was in a situation where I didn't know what I was going to do, I didn't know what my future was going to look like, I, I felt like I had my own back, essentially, right? I felt like, look, I have no idea how, but somehow I'm going to figure this out because... I've done I've done more difficult things basically right I've I've done a lot of difficult things this is not a difficult thing we're at the beginning here it's going to take some time but I'm going to figure this out somehow and I think that helped me to 
you know, I never had in the beginning anyway, I never had like hugely desperate moments or, or, or huge lows or anything. It was more like a slow grind. Now I'm curious, what did you do? What did the first several months um, look like directly after you dropped out? Cause I think this is a really crucial time uh, for anybody stepping out of, of college is those first few months because now you're out of the traditional system, you're out in the real world and you've got to make stuff happen. And so, you know, right after you dropped out those first uh, maybe six months, even a, a year, talk a little bit more about what you're doing. You mentioned you might have been working a part time job. Yeah, yeah. So I was working at least two part time jobs. Um, and I was, but it was pretty chaotic because I was just basically desperately trying to find out how to be an entrepreneur. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and I had many ideas and I tried partnering up with people and I was just, I was just terribly, awfully, horribly naive about everything. Right. So, you know, I, I mean, one of the first things I remember is that I had like, okay, I have this idea for a website, no idea, you know, some whatever harebrained idea for a website and one of my buddies is a programmer so i was like hey listen let's here i have this idea for a website let's do this let's partner up and um you know it even i mean it got as far as having one or two meetings with maybe four people or so who were going to build this thing together but there was just Everything was lacking, right? There wasn't a clear vision of what this was going to be. There wasn't a clear idea of who had what responsibility. There wasn't a clear idea of, of where the money would come from and what would happen or anything. And it basically just fell apart. Right? It fell apart before the first piece of work was done. And there were actually many other projects like that. One of the things that I'd always done is just you know write down ideas and, and work on, on concepts, basically, um, and there were just many, many things where I'd have some idea and I'd go, okay, I want, this is the thing I want to build. And I'd start writing about it. I'd start trying to do something, you know, start trying to make it happen and basically hit a wall somewhere. I'm like, okay, I have no idea how to reach people. Like, how do I get my first client here? I have mm -hmm. no idea. Uh, and then, you know, or again, and I had, yeah, I also had many like just failed projects. You know, I'd, I'd hire someone to build a website for me and it wouldn't work out and, and the website wouldn't be what I wanted and it just kind of just like failed again. And it was a lot of that. Oh, Most man. of the first year or so was just that over and over again. Huh. And so then after that then, I mean, you went through this phase where you're just kind of bouncing around, trying all these different ideas, really naive, a lot of things not working out. Um, what happened after that and what was kind of the first... I guess, uh, business that, that really uh, took and you started sinking your teeth into? So one of the things that, that got me into the online space was, yeah, I started, I started selling custom-built computers and basically selling them on eBay. And these were the, the, the water-cooled ones, right? Yeah, eventually, yeah, I got into that there as well. Okay. Um, and, and so that was the first thing where I was like, okay, now... I have a platform to reach people. In this case, it was eBay. Okay, this is working, right? Okay, I'm, I'm selling some computers. It's not really making me much money, but at least, okay, something's happening here. And right. then through the work I did in the water cooling space, I this is what got me into e-commerce. I basically uh, was like a subcontractor for an e-commerce uh, water cooling parts distributor. And that was so I was running this e-commerce store for a while that went terribly basically I wish I'd never done that <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but that was you know again uh, I did learn some lessons from that as well uh, so I was doing that for a while but I think the main thing that I learned during all of this initial failure there's basically two things that I learned. the first was that I had to I had to be online because I did try some things like you know take taking out an ad in a newspaper or something to try and reach people and that just didn't work at all. And, and so I thought, okay, the thing, I have to be online. That's, that's going to be where I can reach people. And the second thing I realized is that I have to build my own websites. Because I had, like I said before, too many situations where, you know, someone else built the website for me and then I didn't know how to use it. Or um, right. I had this, you know, I was running this e-commerce store, but I couldn't actually make any changes to the store. And I just didn't have enough <laughs> control there, right? 
Oh, and man. so that got me to the point, that, and I was afraid of. I basically thought, oh, I can't, you know, I can't build a website. I'm not technical enough. I'm not, you know. But at yeah. some point, I was like, okay, I got to figure this out. And then I wish I'd done that sooner as well, because then, as it turns out, it's not even that difficult, right? So, <laughs> right. <laughs> so I felt like a bit of a dummy when I figured out, oh, I can actually do this. You know, I can actually learn the basics. This in like half an hour. <laughs> so, um, but then. And I start, so I started building a website and I started, and because another thing that I, that I noticed again and again was that, okay, I had these business ideas and, and I, had, I had stuff that where I felt like, okay, I could offer some value to someone, but I can't reach that someone. And so basically I figured out the problem I have is I, it's a marketing problem. I cannot, I don't know how to market a business, right? And so I decided, okay, I need to learn how to build websites and I need to learn how online marketing works. And that was the thing that, that led me because then I became obsessed with that. I became really interested in that. Just the whole, you know, not just online marketing, just marketing in general. The whole psychology of that is, is really fascinating to me. And so I became obsessed with that. I started building these websites and that's when things actually started rolling where, okay, now I was, you know, started getting a grip on how to build an audience, how to, how to build a good website, how to, how to build a mailing list, how to sell something, how to create better products, sell more of them, and then eventually that got me into software. Okay, and then did that, so was that transition, was that immediately into Thrive Themes or was there something before Thrive? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> No. <laughs> yeah, so keep keep going. After you after you really got into the e-commerce space and then you learned a lot about that and right. build your business. So, and then, yeah, what happened next? So then the next thing was I um I figured out how to create how to do SEO at the time. So this is at the time when search engine optimization was was right. pretty straightforward about backlinks and I really got into that started building all these affiliate websites, getting them ranked for keywords um, with various SEO tactics. And I really, that, and, you know, started making decent income from that. And as I was doing this, I was also blogging about kind of my learning process, right? Built a bit of an audience on that blog and started talking to my audience about, you know, what you need, what, the, what are the problems you're facing, what are your frustrations and so on. And based on that research, built my first information product. So after a bunch of free products that I used to build my mailing list, I built an information product about my method of doing this SEO stuff. Uh, and that was something that sold. That was like the first thing that sold at a volume where that was full-time living for me. What, and what was that volume, if you don't mind sharing some numbers? Oh, um, well, what I remember is that uh, uh, this product... I had this product on the market for two years, and it brought in about $100,000 over the course of two years. Awesome. Yeah, so, so that was like the first, yeah, that was the first kind of real income I had. I built some more information products that I also sold. I then partnered up with uh, a guy called Sam from Switzerland who had built a really cool uh, keyword research software but didn't know how to sell it. So we founded a company called Swiss Made Marketing, and I worked there as the marketing person for a while. Um, well, we built that company up basically from zero to, to, I think we were close to getting to the seven-figure mark when I left. So uh, cool. Awesome. And, then, and I, then I started building my own software. And when I started building my own software, or you know, basically hiring people to build software for me, it was same story all over again, right? In the beginning, I had no idea how to do it, no idea how to find someone <laughs> yeah. who, who, can, who can write code, no idea how to write a specification, no idea how to work with people to, to make sure that stuff gets delivered on time and right. Just absolutely clueless about how to do any of this. Uh, probably sunk about $50,000 into trying to learn how to get software developed before oh, wow. finally releasing my first WordPress plugin which was compared to what we do now a broken mess but you know it was still better than competing solutions which were <laughs> even more broken and even more messy um and that again that made a lot of money that was very successful so built a few more plugins and then at that point i was like okay now we can do something bigger and that was the beginning of thrive themes okay 
Now, when you first started building uh, the, this basic software, these first few plugins and everything, was this? Were you just building these based off of again your own experience and just finding, you know, realizing there was a need that wasn't being met already, or did you have a special process yep. you kind of used to, to to find that or just stumble yeah, across it? No, it's it's basically always a combination of immersion. So you have to be really deep in a market, right? Um, right. Um, so you know, for example, I mean, we we create WordPress products, and to be able to do that, to be able to figure out what kind of a WordPress product you know could make a viable product, you have to be a WordPress power user, right? So and still, you know, to this day, like I spend half my day in some part of the WordPress admin dashboard, right? And so this kind of immersion is very, very important to be able to see opportunities. And then the other part is validation. So when you do find something that you think looks like an opportunity, you have to have a, a way to validate that with the market. You have to have a way to, to figure out, you know, am I the only one who has this problem? And are people who have this problem, if they do exist, are they willing to pay for a solution? Yeah. And so that, that's, uh, I think, a key thing, Shane, that I just want to make sure and pull out for our listeners is I feel like a lot of people, especially while they're still in school, they hear these stories of these, these dropouts that are just, they're making millions or building these seven figure companies and everything. So they start thinking of, you know, uh, of ideas and stuff in certain industries. Um, but it's, it's so much harder when you're not immersed in an industry to come up with a solution that the, the market in that industry needs. And so I think that's so key right there is, you know, find an industry that you that you love, and then just absolutely just dive dive deep. You know, not yeah. even necessarily searching for um, a great business idea right off the bat, but just like you did. You know, you got involved. You learned how to build a website that introduced you to to the WordPress platform, and you started blogging and all this stuff. I mean, you were deep into that. It sounds like before you yeah. started seeing some some real. Uh, needs that weren't being met. Yeah, and I, by the way, you know, you mentioned hearing stories about people, you know, dropping out and making billions and whatnot. Right. I think this is also. I recommend if you want to be an entrepreneur, I recommend to basically um, ignore those stories because those stories are always going to be outliers, and there's always the survivorship bias, right? There's, there's always a problem where okay, so this kid dropped out of college, he had this crazy idea for an app, and he made billions of dollars. And then what we, the mistake we make is that we go, okay, what can we learn from this kid? But in almost all cases, what you can learn from that kid is absolutely nothing. That's like trying to analyze what did this lottery winner do right? Because what you're not seeing is that you're not seeing the 10,000 other kids who dropped out and had a harebrained idea for an app and created the app and nobody gave a shit, right? (laughs) Which is happening all the time. And so I think... And, and it's especially problematic. See, if, if you have someone who, yeah, like, you know, they create this app, it goes viral for some reason, right? Everybody suddenly wants it. Huge success. In almost all cases, that is just luck, right? Mm-hmm. Someone just got lucky. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not trying to diss anyone. It's like, good for you if that happens. But as, it doesn't work as a strategy, it, it, right. You can't copy like that's what I mean when I say you know you can't learn anything from this person because if if you're looking at someone whose first idea made them a billion dollars they have nothing to teach you right yep. the only thing you can basically do is you can say oh I'll try the same thing and I'll hope that my first idea also makes a billion dollars which it won't <laughs> and again you might as well play the lottery yeah. and this is this is a real problem because of course. Those are the most spectacular stories. We love those kinds of stories, right? Nobody really cares about, you know, someone who, you know, basically my story is, is really boring by comparison because I never took a huge leap. I never took a great risk. And I just kind of slowly, step by step built up, you know, from absolutely nothing to a little bit of income to expanding what I'm doing to making a little bit more income and so on and just kind of been ratcheting up like this. This is a boring ass story compared to the kid <laughs> who made a billion dollars of fart app, right? Yeah. But it's it's dangerous to look at the you know the overnight success story and try to learn from it. Absolutely. And Shane, that's why I started Successful Dropout in the first place is because you hear those stories all the time. I I'm a dropout. I I'm a successful entrepreneur, but 
yeah, you hear these outlier stories all the time. And I am a, such a firm believer that in 2016, if you are going to be an entrepreneur, then school is a waste of your time. But nobody ever hears about the, the people like, like you, Shane. And so the, the reason I started this show is to to get you guys all out of the woodwork and, and get you to talk about the story of how you dropped out, you you were grinding, and then you succeeded. And that's that's the tagline for the show. And, you know, it's the tagline isn't, you know, drop out, have a cool idea, become a billionaire. You know, it's yeah. drop out, yeah. it's grind, and, and your story just proves that. You, you were grinding, grinding, grinding for years. And then you experience success. And so that's a great point to pull out there, man, and something that I want everybody listening to take home. Um, now, tell us a little bit more about, I'm curious, how does uh, Thrive Themes generate revenue? How do you generate revenue right now? Is it just Thrive right now, or do you have some other things going on? And, and if so, how do those ventures generate revenue for you? Right, so, well, no, at, the, at this point, it's, it's basically almost all Thrive Themes. I still have some kind of residue from uh, you know some revenue coming in from from my affiliate times basically, um, but none of that is like act you know none of that is actively growing revenue. So that's kind of just leftovers from my activity before. I have now closed down all of my other products. I'm not selling any of the other products, and one of the reasons for that is that I I've always kept my products up to date, and uh, you know even if I have a product that's still selling, if it gets too outdated, I will either update it or I'll stop selling it. And because all of my time has been poured into Thrive Themes, I have now closed down every other product that I ever sold. Um, and, and I really also just wanted to be able to focus fully on Thrive Themes for the moment. So yeah, that's, that's basically where all my revenue comes from. And yeah, like we briefly touched on, we basically we sell plugins and themes and we have both a just a purchase model and also a recurring membership model. And Shane, I won't air this if, if you don't want or you don't have to say anything, but I love to get to the numbers sometime. And if you feel comfortable, um, I'd love for you to share some of your uh, the, some of the client numbers, the membership numbers, and even revenue numbers if, if possible, just because I think that's really inspiring for some people. Is that something you feel comfortable doing? Yeah, I generally don't talk about revenue um, or anything like that. Uh, but... Well, our numbers roughly right now are about 30 something thousand customers and 8,000 something members. Okay. Awesome. And so is that can you at least mention are you kind of in the six figure range still or up into the seven figures oh, no, you know, annual it's, revenue? Yeah. It's well into seven figures, yeah. That's awesome. And so is this something you see yourself doing then kind of long term just growing this business? The well this is going to keep going for sure, right? This is this is going to keep going. But from my perspective, I want to. I'm working on making Thrive Themes as a business more autonomous, so that I can start new businesses and then do the right. whole thing all over again. Awesome, Shane. What would you consider to be your worst entrepreneurial moment? Out of everything you've just told me, is there kind of a quick quick story, something you remember that you just consider one of your moments, uh, one of your lowest moments in your entrepreneurial journey? Yeah, I mean, the one thing that comes to mind was actually uh, was about six days or so into our most successful product launch ever. Um, we had, so and this was the launch of Thrive Themes, which went extremely well. Uh, and, you know, I mean, we, we were seeing thousands of sales uh, over the course of a few days. And, but nothing in our business was set up for this scale at all. We didn't have support staff. We didn't have we didn't have anything basically uh it was it was basically me and paul working on this and we were absolutely not prepared for for this kind of um influx of of customers and it was it was uh on the one hand you know it was amazing to to see this kind of response and it was great to see this kind of success of course but it was also um you know i was pretty close i think to having a nervous breakdown because one thing I remember is that was just a blur, you know, I didn't really have a concept of night and day anymore because I'd just be awake for as long as I could, like doing support tickets and stuff and trying to trying to keep things afloat basically until I kind of, you know, fell asleep on my keyboard and then woke up again a few hours later and continued <laughs> working until I fell asleep again. And then every every few cycles you'd remember that you have to eat and you'd try and 
cram some food in your face and keep going. And it was absolutely horrible. It was an absolutely horrible experience. Um, and yeah, it was, it was this difficult kind of thing because we had this launch. We had everything scheduled. We couldn't really just pull the plug on it either. Um, but somehow, yeah, it's, it's basically, it's like you're, you're riding this beast, right? You're riding this beast. You can't get off. You don't want to stay on. It was absolutely horrible. And I know that that's something that, you know, a lot of people listening would be like, oh, I'd love to have that problem. It's like too many customers. Right, right. right. That's what I'm but thinking. It, it's actually, yeah, it, it's, it is something, you know, uh, it was, it was just emotionally, that was the worst, that was the worst moment I ever had. Um, even though, of course, I'm grateful for it, essentially, because right. that was, you know, it started Thrive Themes with a bang, which is great for us, it's great for the business in the long term, but it was absolutely horrible personal experience. I think the the only relevant thing, you know, I don't think I'd do anything differently. The only relevant thing is th is that this is also one of the, this is one of the reasons why it's really important to just have crazy work ethic, right? If you want to be an entrepreneur, you have to have absolutely crazy work ethic. And that's, by the way, also a litmus test, right? Are you by far the hardest worker you have ever met? If the answer is no, you should probably not be an entrepreneur. And so th this experience, again, was there anything that you, you learned from that? What would you do differently? Yeah, no, I mean, there's, you know, you can't really, obviously in hindsight, we could say, oh, we should have brought on support staff, blah, blah, blah. But you can't know that. You can't know that in advance. So you just didn't realize that it was going to be as popular as it was yeah, we at didn't, launch. Yeah, we, we had no idea that this would happen. Yeah, And so, huh. um, yeah, it's basically, I don't think, you know, with hindsight, of course, you could you could say a lot of things that, that we could have done. But it, it doesn't matter because none of those things apply unless you have a hindsight. So it's really just a matter of, of we had to get through it. And that's why, you know, that's why I bring up the work ethic thing. Like you just have to have the capacity to get through something like that. Yeah. Um, I even, and you know, even though that's obviously a situation, that's like a bad situation with a very, with a very significant silver lining to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but equally there are bad situations with absolutely no silver lining to them. There's there. And this happens really reliably I, in my experience as an entrepreneur, that some huge problem comes up that you have to chew your way through. Yep. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons why, yeah, work ethic is so important that that's also how, I, how I've chosen my business partners. Uh, that's like the number one thing I look for is just has to be someone who can do an absolutely insane amount of work uh, because that's, that's like the yeah. number one thing you have to be able to do. So looking again back at your entire kind of entrepreneurial journey, what's a, an aha moment that sticks out in your mind? I think for me it was um, realizing that, that I could basically ask people for what they needed. I didn't have to come up with it myself um, because that was what led that first product I talked about, the SEO info product, to be a success is that I actually did a lot of research beforehand really basically listened very carefully to what problems people have. And um, so I had a very good idea because, for example, you know, that was my first time writing a sales page and I didn't know anything about writing a sales page basically. But because I had paid a lot, you know, very close attention to how people talk about their problems and so on, a lot of my sales page was basically just reiterating that it was almost like a question and answer kind of thing you know it's like do you have this question well here's the answer i provide in my product and yeah that was definitely you know that's also why that worked so much better than any previous business idea i'd had because all the previous ones were always kind of just me in my head thinking about something whereas that one was me paying attention to what people were saying and building something based on that yeah, that's such a good point, Shane. With successful dropouts, I can speak from personal experience there that that the build it and they will come doesn't is not always true. In fact, like ninety five percent of the time, it's not true. You've got if you can if you can put out a lot of free, valuable content, if you can provide a lot of value to people, you're gonna start to build an audience automatically if you are if you are genuinely providing free value. And then to start to listen to that audience, what are the kind of problems they're experiencing? They will tell you what they want. And then you're basically just giving them what they want. And that is is the way to to start to, to generate sales, to create something that's actually going to going to sell that people will buy. And so yeah. 
Yeah, fantastic, fantastic point. I like this question, Shane. If if you could time travel back to day one of your entrepreneurial journey and have 10 minutes with your former self to communicate any lessons you've acquired with the intention of saving yourself mistakes and heartache, what would you tell yourself? I would tell myself to get into making my own products sooner, specifically with information products, because I had, I already had a lot of experience teaching in various ways. And it's something that I was fairly good at and something that I enjoyed doing. And I think I spent too much time, you know, kind of having other people give me ideas of what I should or shouldn't do or what I, you know, should pursue or shouldn't pursue. Whereas there was this opportunity right there where it's like, hey, listen, you have all this experience already teaching. You like to teach. This is something you're good at. And this is essentially what I did in the beginning, right? With info products, it's basically getting in front of a video camera and teaching stuff. And so I think I could have saved myself. I could have like shortened my learning curve by skipping some of all this other crazy stuff I wanted to do and just being like, hey, look, this is some, this is some value I already have. This is something where I don't have to start from zero. I can teach people stuff online. Um, and so I would say the lesson to take away from that is to, is to have a look at your existing assets, right? Your existing assets. Because new entrepreneurs, new online entrepreneurs very often make this mistake that is that they basically chase after, you know, trendy ideas. So, you know, to give you, to give you an example, let's say, you know, Pinterest bursts onto the scene and suddenly becomes a popular platform. And then you have all these people going, oh, I'm, you know, I'm building a Pinterest business now. I'm being a Pinterest marketer. Or maybe now it's Snapchat or whatever, right? Some thing right. becomes popular. Yeah. And then everybody runs after that thing instead of looking at, well, you know, this has nothing to do with me. I, I have no strength to bring to bear here. It's just a new thing. And I'm running after this shiny new thing instead of doing something where I can actually bring value to the table already. What's a personal habit that contributes to your success? Exercise. Uh, I think regular exercise is, first of all, you know, especially for online entrepreneur kind of thing where you sit on your ass all day. Right. It's pretty important to keep yourself moving in some way as well. And it's also great practice of often very unrewarding, grueling discipline, which is, I think, good quality to have as, as an entrepreneur. What do you consider success to be as an entrepreneur? Because for a lot of people, success is, is relative. So, so for Shane, What's success to you? It's the the amount of value that I can bring. Uh, basically, it's value times people. What's a quality that you have that you would consider essential to being an entrepreneur? Yeah, this will surprise you, but it's work ethic. <laughs> yeah, you said that a few times already. Yeah. What's a business book that you'd recommend to us and why? Uh, it's actually not a business book, but I would recommend reading Switch by Chip and Dan Heath and and perhaps even The Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt because I think for, you know, for who I think is probably a typical listener, a big part of the journey is going to be working on yourself, changing your habits, you yeah. know, basically how do you, how do you build yourself into the kind of person that is a successful entrepreneur and those books can help you on that journey. Awesome. What's an internet resource that you would recommend to everybody like Evernote? Yeah, Evernote is pretty good. Google Drive is good. We uh, we run a big part of our business on Google Drive. It's great for, I, I would recommend, you know, basically starting to use Google Drive for stuff, for your notes and, and, and so on, spreadsheets and so on, because when you get to the point where you want to build a team, it will be super easy to basically be no transition, right? You can just instantly share stuff with the people who need to see it and collaborate and so on. Uh, whereas if you, you know, if you do everything like uh, on your, basically if you have stuff on your hard drive and then you have to figure out how do I share this and send this back and forth and so on, it's going to be a bit of a pain. Shane, what advice do you have for our listeners who are thinking of dropping out of college to be an entrepreneur? Just some parting piece of advice there. Yeah, like I said before, basically don't do it. Uh, you know, quitting quitting uh, college to be an entrepreneur is a bad idea. Quitting your job to be an entrepreneur is a bad idea. If you can't make it happen as a side hustle, you can't make it happen as a full time thing. Okay, so try to make it happen before you drop out and kind of get proof of concept, minimum viable yep. product first. Okay, awesome. What advice do you have for our listeners who've already made that step? They've dropped out and now they're just starting their entrepreneurial journey. <laughs> 
brace for disappointment. I don't know how 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 far ahead are you in this journey. I mean, look, I and I tend to do this. Like, I mean, if you if you listen to other interviews, I guess I'm often a bit more gloomy than your typical, you know, entrepreneur interviewee. Um, and and I emphasize, you know, hard times and hard work and so on. But I think it's really, you know, those are the important qualities. Because you have to make it through the tough times, right? You, and there, there, there are yeah. going to be tough times. So it's really, um, even if you do everything right, there are just going to be there's going to be the dip, right? Seth Godin calls it the dip, uh, where you just have to grind through this thing to get out the other side, and that's what you have to be prepared to do. And uh, so, and and I think that's also important to realize. Even if you do everything right, this is going to happen. Okay, unless you're one of those super super lucky people. Uh, for whom just the first idea happens to work out somehow, but basically it's not going to happen. Um, and so even if you, even if you're, you know, you're strategic and you're smart and you minimize risk and so on, there's going to be these times where you're just going to have a really fucking hard time for a few months, <laughs> and <laughs> you have to be able to get through that. Yeah, and Shane, I really appreciate you um, emphasizing that point because yeah, we do get people, you know, on the show that are. They're just, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs are are positive in general, and and they, you have to be that way to deal with all those times. And sometimes that's all all we hear about is more the positive experiences. And oh, being an entrepreneur is awesome. But you know, I love how you're you're just pulling out the, the truth, you know. And again, just talking about the the slogan for the show: you to drop out, grind, succeed. There's that middle part there, the grind. Yeah. And when you talk about that dip, it's not all happy, fun times, making a million dollars. You know, it's it's <laughs> for a lot of college dropout, it's living in a in a basement with five of your friends eating top ramen and working eighteen hours a day and just failing yeah. over and over again. But again, you learn and failure if you're learning right is just another step to success. So I really appreciate you just, you know, no holds barred, just just making sure that people understand um, you know, the the challenges that they're up for as well. So what's, what's yeah. the next, what, what's next for you? What's, uh, what's next for Shane? What's your next big goal? Oh, I, I have many of them, but right now the focus is still very much on thrive themes. Um, you know, we're, we are still a growing company and there are still some big leaps that we, that we want to make. And, you know, our, our end goal for, or let's say our, our midterm goal for thrive themes is already very ambitious. We really, really want to make this the perfect platform for people who, who want to run an online business on WordPress. And we want to have, um, you know, we, we really want to be able to offer out of, out of one hand basically all the stuff you need uh, because that's something that we've noticed. You know, your typical entrepreneur who builds uh, a website will be using WordPress because that's basically what everyone uses now. But they also typically will have like 50 plugins installed that are all like conflicting with each other and slowing the website down and just creating this huge mess. And that's that's an example of a problem that we've identified, right? That basically pretty much because I know that people listening who are WordPress site owners are basically all groaning as I say this because they go, yes, that's exactly what my <laughs> website looks like, right? And and it's annoying. And so this is a problem that we want to solve with Thrive Themes, which is a really... Uh, you know, it's a big task to try and do that, but we basically want to be able to to give you all the most essential stuff you need to run your business website and have you basically deactivate, you know, half your plugins because you don't need them anymore because you get everything you need from us. Hmm. That's that's what we're working towards. What's the best way people can connect with you? Basically, just go to thrivethemes.com. Um, there you can, first of all, learn more about what Thrive Themes is all about, but also we have a blog there where we publish a lot of stuff, which is all about things like you know how to create a more effective page, how to create a more effective website, um, how to you know we talk about basically how to how to take those steps, how do you go from having a website to actually getting visitors to getting people on a mailing list to all these kind of steps, right? Mm. So we publish a lot of content on that. So even if you're not a customer. Um, that's where you can find more of my content and more of our team's content and where you can just learn more about, uh, you know, how to build a website that will actually work. Fantastic. 
Successful Dropouts, you've been hanging out with Shane and Kylan, learning what it takes to drop out, grind, and succeed as an entrepreneur. For everything we talked about today, head over to SuccessfulDropout.com and type Shane into the search bar, and the show notes will pop right up with everything we talked about today. And as always, stay hungry, stay foolish. For more information about how to drop out, grind, and succeed, go to SuccessfulDropout.com. I also love questions. If you have a question about anything we talked about today, I want to hear from you. Go to SuccessfulDropout.com and click the Ask Me a Question link at the top of the page. Successful Dropouts, if you could go to iTunes and leave a positive rating and review, it would help this show out a lot. I know you're busy. I know you got a lot going on. But if you do that, it helps this podcast rank. It helps other people listen to it and gain value just like you have been. Thank you so much in advance.